Hey guys, Ronnie here. This week's episode is brought to you by NelsieSpencer.com. Everything Nelsie Spencer and losing it is on NelsieSpencer.com. There you can find links to Nelsie's book, movie, and classes. Take Nelsie's writing classes or get one-on-one coaching and sharpen your writing skills. Take classes like screenwriting class and novel writing first draft. If you'd like to support the show, grab a couple things at the Losing It merch store where we have mugs, t-shirts, hoodies, hats like this one, the one I'm wearing, and much more. If you're watching this on YouTube, check out links to nelsiespencer.com and other things such as the links to our equipment we use and all our social handles in the description down below. And if you want to contact us, tell us you love us, hate us, want to tell us you're losing a story and possibly have Nelsi read it on the show, email us at losingitcontact at gmail.com. Losing it, losing it, losing it, losing it, losing it, losing it, losing it. Losing it. If you got a story, we don't care if it's happy or gory. So come share your losing it story with us. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Losing It with me, Nelsie Spencer, and Ronnie Whaley. Hi, Ronnie. Hello. How are you, darling? Very good. Are we, are we doing synchronized sipping? I think we are. Mm. Mm. <laughs> He's not drinking out of a losing it mug, so I know that even though his coffee is good, it's not as good as mine. <laughs> I had the pack mine already. I oh my god, Ronnie's guy, guys, Ronnie's moving. Yeah, I'm leaving. Ronnie, he's leaving on a jet plane. I am. Doesn't know I, when he'll be back again. <laughs> I was thinking of like recording some audio clips on my trip to play uh, for for these episodes. Um, I think that's probably a good idea because it's going to be kind of weird, you know, like traveling during COVID and then I'm going to be quarantined in a hotel for 10 days. So yeah, and tell them how long, like this is a, this is epic what you're doing, right? First you're leaving, you're leaving New Hampshire, which you haven't left for, oh no. Did you go into Manhattan ever? Have you been there the whole time? I know I've visited, I lived in New York for a couple of months during the year. Right. Um, but then yeah. once you and Abaz went up there, did you did you go back? Yeah, yeah. I came back for a couple for the summer. I came back because my job, they started my old job. They started, uh, oh. you know, how they opened up again, like the, the city yeah. where they let people inside. Um, I did it for a couple months and then was out of there. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah, but I only visited a couple times. I haven't seen much of the real world in a very long time. So. Yeah, it's just just a cabin, <laughs> a cabin in New Hampshire. Yeah, just yeah. yeah. So, well, it's funny because I've had students say to me, um, "So you're gonna you're gonna come and teach in the city? You're gonna do face to face?" And I'm like, "Wow, yeah, that's you, an idea." You've done that? Have you done that? <laughs> I, I saw. A I've still not you, been in the city. Like you teaching did? in the park or something. Bryant Park. Yeah. Was that Bryant Park? Gotham. Oh. Yeah, Gotham does a thing once a year or used to every July does a big free thing in Gotham park or in um, Bryant park. And I've done it a couple of times. Very fun. It looks relaxing. Yeah, it's, it is, it is. It's very, <laughs> but it's so weird because since I've, since I don't, since I can do everything from home, the idea of like getting on a bus, <laughs> you know, I, driving to the bus stop, getting on a bus, getting off the bus, going through port authority, walking. Yeah. I mean, it just seems like, I don't know. It just seems so archaic. <laughs> yeah. Why well, even do that? Although, you know, it might be nice to see some people face to face. Right? So I don't, I don't know. know. I have to figure that out. Yeah. So you so you have to leave, you're leaving New Hampshire, then you're going to the city, and then Yeah, I'll be in New York for a week. Got reservations to Comedy Cellar. Very exciting. Yeah. They right just on. opened up recently. Um, they, they were closed for the longest time and now they recently opened up and a lot of big comics are coming in because, you know, everybody's going crazy. Yeah. All these comics that have, that are normally are in front of a mic, you know, at least seven times a week, they're losing their minds. Yeah. So like in the last, like in the past three weeks, like Ray Romano, Dave Chappelle, Chris Rock, Louis CK, they've all been to the cellar in the past three weeks alone. Yeah. No kidding. So that's why I'm like, this is a good time to be over there. And that's then I'll be, uh, then I have to leave. <laughs> then I have to leave. Yeah. So you get some, you get some, you get some of your uh, comedy cup filled up, so to speak. 
And then how long's the flight, Ronnie? The flight is around like 15 hours. Then I have a layover. And then it's like another four hours. So like 19 hours. Because you're literally, yeah, the Philippines, the time difference in the Philippines is 12 hours. So in my mind, it's it's like on the opposite face of the the earth. Yeah. It's on the opposite side of the earth. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I can't say I'm going to miss you because (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I will miss you, I guess, but I feel like we (laughs) will still see each other when we've never seen each other in person. Yeah. Well, we're going to try to see each other uh, that week I'm there. Yes. In New York. Yes. That's a perfect reason for me to go in. Really? That's (laughs) okay. I'm coming. So you'll be there when, from when to when? From the 5th to the 11th. I think the 5th or the 6th, either that, either of those days, to right. the 11th. All yeah. Right. I'll, I'll come and in. And I'm throwing I'll a party in. in the city. Everyone should come. I'm just kidding. I'm not. <laughs> I was going to say, where are you throwing a party? <laughs> At the Comedy Cellar? <laughs> no. I'm throwing a party with me and my two other friends. And it's just going to be the three of us. And it's going to be. Yeah. Gonna three be of lovely. you guys having some edibles. <laughs> 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 Probably not. <laughs> So, so, um, so I was listening to Smartless. I, you know, forever, I'm forever like, you know, giving podcasts that do not need a leg up, a leg up. You're so charitable. Yeah. I'm, you know, that's just, you know, that's how I am, Ronnie. That's how I am. I know. Um, and actually listening to Conan O'Brien interview, uh, Daniel Radcliffe, which I heard I have that to say, one. I just heard that. Ah, uh, yeah. so recommend, so recommend. I mean, first of all, he's Harry Potter. Yeah, they, yeah. He's, he's not a dick, right? He turned out to be such a nice guy. Yeah, they had that conversation about how like it was really easy. They, the hopes the hopes weren't high for him as a child actor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. It was like when people meet him. Yeah, yeah. When he, they, people meet him, he's like not like not on crack. They're like, wow, he turned out pretty good. Wow. <laughs> <It's> like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Like, wow, you show up on time. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Something's wrong. <laughs> but then you also think, you know, maybe it's a British thing. Maybe the, you know, the, the whole, because I don't think any of those guys from Harry Potter, you know. That's true. Shaved uh, yeah. their head or, you know, ended up in rehab. I, I don't know. I, yeah, it's mostly American child actors that. Yeah, that probably have. I don't want to make a sweeping generalization. Well, yeah, I do. But, um, you know, I think that the parents can really fuck them up. Oh, yeah. For sure. Those stage parents is scary. Yeah, I mean, like the whole Britney Spears thing. I was going to just say Britney Spears, case in point. And like her dad. It's insane. Free Britney. Free her. Yeah, it's so crazy. I mean, I can't believe that they haven't just gone in, like a SWAT team hasn't gone in and just saved her ass. Yeah, it's so Although crazy. I'm sure there's legal reasons for that. She's like a full grown adult. I know. <laughs> I know. So and the whole thing about the IUD, they won't let her have kids. Yeah. It I was mean, a it's like, IUD. what is it like? I know. It's like Handmaid's Tale in reverse. It's like, what the fuck is going on here? Man. So um, did you see that, that, um, that Dolly Parton? The Dolly Parton thing. Dolly Parton recreates a Playboy photo shoot for husband's birthday for Hot Girl Summer. Hashtag Hot Girl Summer. Yeah. Hashtag Hot Girl Summer. You know, good for her. Good for her. Are, do you, are you going for a picture of the husband? No. Well, it's just the back of his head. Yeah. <laughs> Dolly's looking good. It's so funny because I did that too just the other night for my husband. Oh, I have okay. a little Playboy. I, yeah, I have a Playboy bunny thing. I just keep, you know, I send it to dry cleaners once a year. And, you know, I just I once just hop year. around the bedroom, <laughs> hop around the bedroom once in a while. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, actually, I actually was just thinking the other day, like every once in a while, I'll put on something special for my husband. And I realized this thing that I put on, it was really just a camisole. It's nothing really weird. And I thought, oh, my God, I've had this for 20 years. <laughs> And you know why? Because I only wear it three times a year for 20 minutes. So it's like it never wears out. (laughs) Right? That's so funny. It's like lingerie can last for a very long time. And depending on your lifestyle, yeah. Depending on yes. I'm yeah, I don't wear I don't wear it while I'm cleaning the kitchen or doing the dishes or anything. Yeah. 20 (laughs) minutes. Here it is. Do you like it? Good. Goodbye. That's it. Yeah. 
Uh, but, oh, her husband, his name is Carl. Well, she is a hot chick. Which I'm sure is, sure is politically incorrect to say that. Is hot chick. Playboy not a thing anymore? I don't think Playboy's a thing anymore. Oh, man. Yeah. That's and yet bad. we go on. Yeah, we go <laughs> Ronnie's on. Ronnie's really sad. <laughs> Ronnie's just going to mourn that. Oh, man. <sighs> oh, man. man. Well, guess what? July 20th is my mom's birthday. Oh, really? Oh, I mean, and she's dead. But we all, my brothers was she on and I all text. She was. That's so, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> oh, she was. Okay. That's how I knew she it. Was. She was 74 when she was in Playboy. I so, see. yeah, she didn't want to she didn't want to show up, Dolly. Oh, my mother in Playboy, that is a funny. Yeah, she was dressed kind of like this <laughs> with, with a <laughs> collared shirt, collared shirt and a cardigan. Yeah. She had a stern look on her face. And a, and a martini in her hand. <laughs> yeah. no, she was smiling. She was smiling, smiling, but no nipples. No, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> All right. So um we have Jeffrey Marsh on. And if you don't know Jeffrey Marsh, they are an Instagram sensation. They started on Vine, turns out, and they're also on TikTok. And basically they're um I think they describe themselves in a, in lots of ways because they're a, a life coach, but they're also an LGBTQA plus, see, I got that right, advocate or activist. So that's kind of interesting because what they do a lot is sort of enlighten people about pronouns and why they matter. And they have a very interesting background. And they also wrote a book and so you can get the book and the audio book. So Yeah. I reached out to them. I DM'd them. They said, I'll do it. And here they are. So hi, everybody. I'm so excited. I This is the first time my palms have ever sweated. And I've done... The, yes, yes. I'm and shocked. Is, I think this is... <laughs> no, in, in the podcast. I mean, my palms have sweated, you know. Uh, various <laughs> events, you know, and sometimes uh, alone in my bedroom. Not real life events. Okay, great. <laughs> but I don't think I've ever sweated before with a guest. And this is my, I think you're my 90th guest. So um, I'm so happy and excited to have found this wonderful person. They are a big huge presence on Instagram. Interestingly, interestingly, I found them through Nisha Brost, who is a TikTok person. I mean, my God, and I just spend my life on social media and she was telling me about them. So I like found them on Instagram and started following them, liking absolutely every post they did because I love their spirit. I love their message. I love their heart. I love their courage. I love their accessories and their, <laughs> all of their outfits, but the accessories do rule and the lipstick and eye shadow choices. So with that, I am going to introduce the wonderful, fabulous um, Jeffrey Marsh. Hi. Hi. I think that's one of the loveliest intros I've ever had in my entire career. Well, that makes me happy. And may I compliment your lipstick? I hope Thank some you. people are seeing the videos, you know, on social about this episode and get to see the looks as well. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Thank you. And you thank you so much. So so oh my goodness. Um when I find somebody that I am interested in and you know my interests are varied. Um there's almost always a heart connection for me. You know, whether it's, sometimes it's an animal rescuer, sometimes it's um um so somebody who's a, a licensed clinical social worker, somebody, sometimes it's an actor. Like I want to have Sean Hayes on because he talks about his uh, alcoholic father and his childhood, but I never hear enough. Like I really want to hear his story. So, so the connection is always a heart connect, excuse me, always a heart connection. So when I saw your Instagram feed and I saw your face and I heard what you were saying and let's not forget the teeth, which we'll talk about later, because he has <laughs> he has the whitest teeth I've ever seen of anybody on the planet. Just saying that right out. They have the whitest teeth. They, you did oh, so good did in so, the intro. I did so good in the intro, and then I fucked up. <laughs> I could I, tell I, you practiced. I knew I was going to fuck up. <laughs> I knew I was going to fuck up. Uh, I did. Which I is actually great. And something I love about your style is that you're not afraid to. 
Oh, thank you, honey. People like me, so we haven't mentioned it yet, but I'm a non-binary person. And people like me have made this weird transition lately from being, oh, people are afraid of us because they think we're freakish, uh, that we're dangerous or something like that, all the way over to this new space where people are afraid to say the wrong thing around us. And I don't, I don't want either of those. <laughs> I don't want, I don't want anything to do with either of those. Well, and that's what I love about you. It's, it's like how, first of all, one of the things that I've only been working on, I don't know, probably for less than a decade is more compassion, more self-compassion, more compassion for others, less judgment for others, less judgment for self. And you have seemingly this endless font of, of compassion and, uh, we'll get into this more, but Jeffrey talks a lot about um, the cisgender, the cisgender allies, which I love. That's mm-hmm. so lovely. It's such a lovely term, and basically allowing us to go. So what? What the fuck is non-binary? And excuse me, wait, wait. I need a glossary. I need flashcards. Something, and and we have come to this place where. It, it feels like I need a rule book. And if you didn't get the rule book and you fuck up, then there's a lot of judgment, which even mm. as I say that, I feel like, yeah, you know, like my judgment's here compared to what's happened for the non-binary person. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm cisgender. I'm a white woman who grew up in a certain environment. So yeah, big whoop, you know, you'll survive it, Nelsie. But I do feel like <laughs> you, no, no. But- <laughs> you talked your, your way through <laughs> Such a high level of allyship. Uh, go ahead. So what I'm saying is, I love the fact that you're like, it's okay. It's okay if you get it wrong. It's okay. I know it's a whole new thing. As long as you're trying. Yep. So how did you find your way to this sort of amazing, beautiful position that you're in? That's a big question. Uh, well, I was famous on Vine, if you remember Vine. Do. And those videos are six and a half seconds. So that was just enough time for me to say something like, there is nothing wrong with you. And I had to take all of the messages that I had been learning on my own and distill them into the most potent version for that particular platform. TikTok, the videos are 30 seconds, a minute, sometimes three minutes long. And that's luxurious. <laughs> and of course, you can do even longer on Instagram. But the core message hasn't changed. I, I went away and lived at a Buddhist monastery because I hated myself so completely. I had to do something drastic. When was that? That I've been studying Zen for about 20 years. I, when going into this, I was thinking this might be a two-parter. It might be a two-parter because I have so many questions. Um, so 20 years ago, you had such extreme self-hate, but it's interesting that you were like, I need to go to a Zen monastery. I mean, that didn't, you didn't look it up in the yellow pages, something you must have already been in that world to a certain extent, or you were already a seeker. Is that true? Uh, I would say I was a seeker to the extent that I was taking yoga classes, for example, But I also was obsessed with this bookstore. I was living in Philadelphia at the time, and it was a quote unquote spiritual bookstore. And I, my mom is is a pastor, and I had been raised Lutheran, and this was so far as a you know circa twenty year old person, this was just way outside the universe I had been taught um, to to encounter. And so I was obsessed with this bookstore. They they had all kinds of spiritual books. And I went in one day and there was a book across the store called There Is Nothing Wrong With You. Speaking oh, of that message. Oh. And my feet started moving toward the book. My heart started moving toward the book. And interestingly enough, at the same time, my brain started saying, of course, there's something wrong with you. Here's the list. <laughs> Do you want the oh, list in alphabetical yeah, order yeah, or yeah. order of importance? Uh, <laughs> yeah. you know. Oh, my God. The brain just started going um, anti-Jeffrey, but the heart was already connecting with that book, and it was written by a lady who runs a monastery. 
clearly that was a moment that created a, a, a big change in you and put you on a path. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Without even knowing it. Oh my God. And God bless that store, right? That gave you a portal into that, you know, and, and, and this world. Yes. The book title said, there is nothing wrong with you. And even though your brain was going, whatever, your heart won over your heart. Instead of going, well, that book's a bunch of crap. Obviously there's a lot of shit wrong with me. You went to it. Yeah. How many times in my life had I seen that book in quotes and said, that book's full of shit (laughs) already, right? Yeah. But there was something magical about this place and about this day and about just the importance that my, you know, the way I would phrase it is my heart wanted me to see that book at all costs. How do you describe yourself? I I, I hear you talk a little bit on, (laughs) on, no, I mean, you, I mean, I think feel like in some ways you're non-definable in a wonderful, fantastic way, um, as I think we all are. You know, I mean, we can put ourselves in boxes and say, oh, I'm this, that, and the other, and yet we're so much more than all those labels. But I, th- I know you, I know you um, use the term life coach sometimes. Is that correct? Yes. I, I think that phrase is a little overused, or that title, rather. What I really do is teach people to accept who they are well, and everything about them. And I do that one-on-one. So yes, life coach. I, yes. And, and I just <laughs> want to say that if, if you're not following Jeffrey on Instagram, and I, I found them through Instagram, I haven't um, ventured into your TikTok, but they have this way of looking at you. When you look at me through Instagram, I feel you so deeply. I feel your love and your compassion and your acceptance and your understanding. It is, and it's transformational and really transformational. And so thank you. Thank you for that so much. So you're if you're not welcome. following them, go immediately and do because it's, it's lovely uh, and and you also don't know what you're going to get, which is great. Um, uh, I mean, beyond the accessories and the lipstick color, which I love so much. Um, but what I was going to say is um, about four years ago, I found my way to a life coach. And I stepped into my first therapy session when I was 17 years old, maybe 18. And, you know, I've spent a long time working on myself and healing myself and trying to be healed. And when I found Svetlana four, three or four years ago through interesting situation, I wasn't looking for a life coach. I was helping her write her um, entrance essay into graduate school to get her MSW. I, she racked up all these hours with me and I was like, let's do a trade. Like the minute I knew she was a life coach and she just was so something about her and what we worked on was self-love and self-acceptance. And, dis- and even with all those years of therapy and 12 steps and all those different things, meditation, that changed me in a profound way in w- that I'd never been changed before. And I continue like, oh, I have to love myself. What a concept. Oh, I get to love myself. Oh my goodness. I might actually be loving it's myself. It's possible to love oneself. I, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let's start with the fundamentals. Yeah. Let's absolutely. start with the fundamentals. Oh, oh, it's okay to love yourself. It's even a goal versus like, oh, don't be conceited or yeah. don't be right. It's not selfish. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I absolutely know that as a person doing this work and trying to help people do this, I'll never be out of a job. I'll never have a lack of people who have been taught that there is something wrong with them and we need to undermine that. Yeah. And so many, um, so many folks try to dive into this work using a frame of, I'm going to figure out what's wrong with me and then I'm going to fix it. You know, people like you and I, we've, we've (laughs) seen enough that we know it's time for a totally different approach than that. A totally different approach. I feel a shift. Jeffrey, do you feel a shift? I feel a shift in the in the population. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like a shift toward more consciousness, you mean? Yes, towards more more consciousness towards I mean, look how many followers 
you have. You have those followers because people are looking for what you have to offer. And what you are offering is self-acceptance and self-love and letting go of this idea that you're broken and you need to be fixed. What I'm offering, I hope, yes. is a mirror to the truth. Yeah. That there's nothing wrong with people. I think people seeing... <laughs> In social media, we call ourselves thumb stoppers. I don't know if you've ever heard that I term. haven't, I haven't, no. But people are scrolling through with their thumb and it's an image, it's a phrase, it's an energy, it's a you know personality, whatever, that stops them, puts their thumb down on the screen and they're like, ooh, what's that? Yeah, yeah. And I think partly why I'm such a thumb stopper is that I'm an LGBTQ person who has no shame, does not hate myself, which is still rare, unfortunately. But also, I'm hopefully a well-polished mirror to show people that whatever they were told is the equivalent, right? Whatever they were, you know, my LGBTQ-ness is a metaphor, right? So whatever they were told is wrong with them, they can be happy too. Yes, absolutely. And I think that, I think we all carry shame and we all, you know, regardless of every, I think, I I think it's fair to say that everyone on the planet, um, has shame because we, (laughs) it's part of, you know, what a sad state, right? Yeah. It's, it's part of the process. You become, I, I was just listening to Nicole Sachs. I don't know if you know who she is, but she, you know, yes. And she was talking about, it's kind of hard to go from like a kid who doesn't have any boundaries to be given boundaries and learn when you're, it's okay to cry and you need to, you know, elbows on the, off the table or whatever the fucking rules are. Even if you don't care about those things, we do need to fit into a framework. So it's hard for that to happen and not internalize that and feel like I'm wrong. I've done, I'm doing it wrong. Right. Yeah, nearly impossible. Exactly, exactly. So, because when you say you have no, you don't have shame or self hate, is that like across the board? Like, is that really true? Do you know what I mean? Like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> Am like, I going to turn this microphone no. <laughs> off and hate myself? <laughs> no, no. I'm just saying that seems like uh, like otherworldly to me. That to have moments of of not having shame, or even days, or even weeks of not having shame, or even even when shame comes along, be able to go, oh, there, there's that shame again, and have maybe a, a separation from it. But to be shame free seems like I don't know otherworldly. I don't know. I absolutely mean it. It's my commitment and I worked hard at it. And it's true in my day-to-day life. It doesn't mean that old patterns don't try to do what they're going to do. Yeah. Because I think that's a very human thing. But no. Do do I hate myself? Nope. Do I feel ashamed? Nope. That makes me so happy and, and hopeful. And <laughs> no, it does. It does. I'm happy to talk more about it. I mean, to me, it's my my moment to moment existence. So I don't, when people ask me about it, I don't know what they're, I mean, I know what it's like to be a person living with shame. I did it enthusiastically for years, but I don't know what kind of ways to talk about it would be helpful. I, I walk around a lot of the time saying nice things to myself. That is something I've habitualized. Do you have a couple of go-tos or ones that maybe you're saying, you're saying a lot lately or? Well, universal across the board. Thank you. I love you. I'm here with you. I was in a, um, I was going to say in a town that shall not be named, but who cares? Let's name it. Upstate New York. It's called Ogdensburg, uh, New York. And I had done, this was before the pandemic, and I had done a gig, and I was wearing a a sequin gown in the middle of Ogdensburg, and the Uber came to get me at the college where I spoke to the young folks and drove me back to the hotel, dropped me off in the parking lot of the hotel. And in the couple of steps of driving across where the Uber dropped me off, which was not directly in front of the door, toward the door of the hotel, a large like on high wheels, um, pickup truck started, uh, driving behind me. And these two people, guys, men inside the car were like, are you in a dress? Why are you wearing a dress? Right. 
And I started literally breathing and saying, I'm here with you, Jeffrey. I love you. I'm grateful for you. Thank you for who you are. I also picked up the pace a little bit and walked faster. (laughs) But I was telling myself nice things while I did that and got into the hotel. And I ended up being safe. But, you know, it was just an automatic uh, way to be with myself. That is so fantastic. I love that so much. So fantastic that that has become an automatic way to be with yourself. I love you, Jeffrey. I'm here for you. Thank you. I appreciate you. I mean, that is fantastic. I'm going to immediately start doing that. Oh, I think you should. Absolutely. One of, you know, it hasn't been the most pleasant thing to be treated terribly for a lot of my life because of who I am. But I have that no self-hate policy internally Mm. out of necessity. I was driven to this edge. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. But it, you know, I have to, because I can't devote brain space to other stuff. It would destroy me. Yeah. Ah, well, Ah. I just just adore you. I just adore you. I mean, I found you and I was like, I have to have him on. And then you said yes. You said yes. Of course. I know you have a losing it story for me. I have 25 more questions, but I feel like some of my questions might be answered by your losing it story, but I am, I'm ready to hear it. Sure. And, you know, it's related to everything that we've been saying. This is more or less the story of how I lost self-hate. Oh, fantastic. I had moved to the monastery and in the monastery where I trained, we lived in individual, they were called hermitages, um, little huts uh, where you'd be by yourself. And often, um, I trained with not being able to sleep, which is an issue for a lot of people, especially around self-hate. All of a sudden you're awake at three in the morning and it's like, you did this and you said that. And, you you know, let's replay every awful thing that you ever did with your life. So I got to look at all that stuff in the space and the context of being away from, you know, what we might call regular society. And I was about to Go So I had done a couple of different stays at the monastery, and I was about to leave the monastery and go back out to that regular world. It was the night before. And how and, old were you, Jeffrey? Oh, gosh. Um, this must be 15 or so years ago, so around late 20s, mm-hmm. 30, somewhere okay. around there. And I started having especially difficult thoughts and not, you know, when I talk about these issues, I try, so I'm about to talk about suicidal thoughts. Okay. When I talk about the, these issues, I always try to balance not um, triggering folks, which is important if they want to keep themselves safe, but also not stigmatizing the subject. Because there are a lot of people who feel feel like they're the only ones who have thoughts like that. Yeah. And these thoughts were coming in a big wave that particular night. And I remember the moon was just uh, big. It was close. (laughs) And, you know, the air was, uh, this was in California, so it was like crisp, um, clean air. And just these constant thoughts that I shouldn't be here. And the reasons why and, you know, what, the physical sensations to go with that. And all of this was coming to a head. And the meditation hall at the monastery was open 24-7. And I just went in to the meditation hall by the moonlight and sat facing the wall and literally sat with those thoughts. And this was the first time in my life that I realized that I had some, I, how do I want to phrase it? I realized how powerless those thoughts are. I know that they affect a lot of people. I I want to affirm that they are difficult for everyone. And I saw that just because my thoughts say something, I don't have to do something 
and something broke, um, something, um, you know, the chain of, I think this, therefore I have to do this Mm. was broken for me in those moments. And it helped me immeasurably in all of my life because I realized if my thoughts don't mean anything about me, then certainly other people's thoughts don't mean anything about me either. Wow. Right? Their opinions of me don't mean anything. I started treating myself very well after that. <laughs> uh, that was 15 years ago. And mm-hmm. and uh, I always feel like for me, um, you know, that I, I always have this expectation that like, you know, recovery or getting better or you know, therapy or whatever is going to be sort of this beautiful, you know, uh, 45 degree angle of an upward trajectory and, and, uh, (laughs) right. And then when it's not, I'm so surprised, you know, and like once you, once you realize Uh, something, then you're so, so walk me through a little bit about how you got from there to, I, I mean, I'm happy to go all the way to the present, but I do think that, um, when you were doing these six and a half uh, second videos on Vine, that seems to me to also be another, you know, pivotal moment where you've, you have this message and you have to get it out there. So how did you go from that moment in the meditation room where I love what you said about, you know, just because you think it doesn't necessarily mean it's true or doesn't necessarily mean you have to act on it, that uh, what your own thoughts think about you, then certainly other people's thoughts about you, don't don't mean are anything. Totally irrelevant. It totally yeah. that was the word I was looking for. Are totally irrelevant. And my God, it's so unbelievably true. And yet, I don't want to use the word radical, but it's kind of radical because, I mean, how much time it's it's possible to spend your entire day thinking about other people, what other people think of you. I mean, you know, I can wa- I can wonder what the teller at the bank thinks thinks about me. I, I'll never see her again. And, and when I realize that I'm doing it, I'm like, she's not thinking about you, Nelsie. You know what I mean? So anyway, so, so you have this moment and, and, and then what? You're in your late twenties, early thirties. Wait, I want to ask you a meta question. I'm going to flip the script. Oh, I'm going to turn things it, baby. around. Flip it. So you said something so profound and important about worrying about what a bank teller thinks about you and prob- and the realization that probably that bank teller is not even, it's not even like that bank teller is thinking something positive or negative about you. That bank teller is at lunch. <laughs> doesn't care. Right. <laughs> and then afterwards you said, well, anyway, that I'm was listening. such an important, profound thing. And I don't think it's in any way, if you know what I mean. That yes. was actually incredibly, incredibly important. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And I, I, you know, I just recognized a habit in myself for years and years and years to say the most profound thing, the most vulnerable thing. Yeah. And then to say, well, you know, anyway, and not in, not even in like a dismissive thing, but in like a protecting myself thing. Cause I don't want people right. to judge me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's cause it's pretty knee jerk. You know, it's pretty knee jerk. The well, anyway, right? It's pretty knee jerk, right? I don't, because you know, yeah. So that's a, that's a good. Thank you for that. Yep. I appreciate that. And I, I just want to say that I'm so grateful that I continue to grow, and that I meet people like you, and that I somewhere, somewhere in my late fifties, early sixties, when I went through a really dark time and was so mad that I wasn't fixed yet. You know, so fucking mad. I was like, are you Mm -hmm. kidding me? Are you fucking kidding me? You know what I mean? It was like, I'm not done yet. I do know what you mean. Yeah. So, and then something happened. I met Svetlana and I went from being mad to being grateful to being, oh, I can, to discovering new things, to seeing myself differently, to, to realizing that I was never broken, that I've always been perfect. And, and that I can also continue to grow from like, hopefully from now on till after I take my last breath, you know? So, and, and, and meeting you and, 
and growing because of the way you talk about the LGBTQ plus community and talk about um, they, them, and talk about pronouns made me grow because I'm a cisgender woman and I'm like- Are you sure it was me? Hmm? Are you sure it was me? Are you sure you didn't grow on your own? Oh, no. You used me as an excuse? Yes. No, I'm- I used you as an excuse to grow. I mean, Absolutely. thank you for the compliment. Yeah, but. no, but what I'm saying is it's easy to go, oh, I'm of a certain age and I grew up and my brother's gay. And so, you know, like I don't have to know all that new stuff, which doesn't seem to have anything mean in it. But listening to you gave me a perspective that I did not have and that I didn't even know I needed. So that is what I, that is the gift that you gave me and that you, I think are giving a lot of cisgender people because it's easy to make an LGBTQ plus joke. And some of the, most of those jokes happen if you are lacking compassion and understanding. Uh, yeah. And you know, what you made me think of is someone who says to themselves, I'm old and I'm not going to learn this new stuff. Um, they're probably not also not learning the quote unquote new stuff for them of undermining the self-hate in their lives. Yes. Yeah. So if you want to commit across the board to being stuck in your ways, I would examine my ways. Examine my ways. <laughs> before, yeah. I, before I want to make sure I'm going to, you know, commit to being stuck in them. Yeah. When I, I just want to clarify that when I said it's easy to make an LGBTQ joke, what I, I wasn't, what I was talking about in that specific thing is. I love that you said it. Joke about that whole, all those, all those letters, you know what I mean? Like, oh, this not of joking. Course. And in my mind, I'm not joking about the people, but I'm, it's so dismissive. And you, you point, you, you pointed that out for me in a way that I could hear it. Well, I'm glad you clarified that. I didn't mind when you said it for the record, and it is easy. Yeah. We are one of the groups of people on the earth for whom it is still socially acceptable to hate us, to hate on us, to make jokes, to... Yeah. I mean, Hollywood does it, so... <laughs> uh, yeah, we're, we're, not, we're not quite there yet. We're getting better, but we're not quite there yet with total acceptance for people like us. Thank you for that. Thank you so much for, for all of that. Of course. And you know, the other thing, the other metaphor that you bring up for me is um, people tell me, you know, that hateful, hateful, hateful people will always say you're too sensitive. You, you know, why do you have to have all these pronouns and rah, 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 you know, don't be so sensitive, right? And I just think, how how in the world did your mom and dad treat you? <laughs> So that your driving force in life is to try to police other people out of being sensitive. Out of being sensitive, right. It's not what I said or how I said it or what I did is that you're too sensitive. Stop being so sensitive. Oh my goodness. I had I was I had some oh yeah. And and also the the idea of that, you know, how did your mom and dad treat you? And what is your own level of self-judgment, right? Because for me, and I and not that I'm free of judgment. I'm not. I'm not free of judgment um, f for myself and others. But I'm getting better, and and I re I notice that as much as I judge, as as my self judgment eases and goes down, so does my judgment of others. So does my as my compassion for self increases. So does my compassion for others. So yeah. So yeah. So so Jeffrey, as you're now doing what you do. And it seems to me that you completely love it. Talk to me a little bit about what you love about it the most. And I guess how it's changed you because I mean, you've been doing this kind of work for how long now? Gosh, I mean, if Vine marks the start of it, Vine was around, I guess, 2012, 2013. Right. So for eight or nine years, you've been doing this kind of work of spreading, spreading the idea of um, nothing's wrong with you. Right. Right. 
how, what's the part about it that's the, that you love the most and how has it changed you? When I do Q and A's, um, a very popular Q, um, that I very, you know, I deftly try to give an A for is don't you get tired of it? Dealing with all these people that don't understand you day in and day out. And, you know, as an activist, you give so much and don't you ever feel empty and et cetera, et cetera. And the answer, of course, is sure, sometimes. Um, I do, you know, feel tired because <laughs> I'm not superhuman. But we are where we are. Yeah. My teacher at the monastery used to say, with the ideal comes the actual. So the ideal would be that I wouldn't have to walk into every room as a person and an educator. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That I wouldn't have to have the dual role uh, constantly, right. 100% of the time. But we don't live in that world. So I could spend time lamenting that. And I certainly have reactions and feelings, which are okay. But we are where we are. Yeah. And I choose to devote my life to getting us to where we want to go in the future. I have so many more questions. Which one should I choose? <laughs> um, so I know that you grew up in, in um, Pennsylvania and it was pretty damn challenging. Would that be a accurate? <laughs> <laughs> to put one word on it, that is the one to choose. Yep. Challenging. Challenging. Indeed. And how often do you get to um, interact with and be supportive of LGBTQ plus kids, teens, preteens? Pretty constantly. And, and do you want to know why? Yes. Because I selfishly get something out of it. It's really wonderful to walk into a Zoom, a Zoom room, um, where now we're starting again to, to, have, to be in physical spaces together and be among a group of people who were not trained with the same baggage around LGBTQ identity as I was. Oh, right. I just walk in the room and they get it. They use the pronouns. They talk about gender the way that I do. They just, just, just automatic for them. Right, right. They you have don't stuff have to, going you on. Have, you don't have to give them the pamphlet <laughs> and the glossary. Because, right, exactly. Yeah. Exactly so. They're not saying, oh, help me, Jeffrey. <laughs> <laughs> well, and because. they're also, I mean, they are, I get inspired by their resiliency and, you know, because we're not in that perfect world. And so they're still facing discrimination. Yeah. But they have, you know, and I don't want it to, I don't know why, maybe it should. I was about to say, I don't want to turn it into when I was a kid, um, but I'm about to say, when I, when I was a kid, there was no TikTok. There was no Instagram. Um, Queer Eye was not, the first one was not on TV yet. Uh, I had almost no examples, no Will and Grace yet um, on TV, the first one. Ellen, not yet. And I think the idea that they can pick up a device that is so intimate, that is in their hands... And if I may brag, see someone like me tell them they're worthy. Yeah. That that is a very different life experience for them. And I'm happy if, you know, if I could be a part of it in any way. Oh, my God. So fantastic. So fantastic. Oh. You're talking about yourself? Uh, yes, yes, I am so. Oh, my God. No, you're so fantastic. Oh, my God. Look at your lipstick. Oh, my God. I don't know if you noticed the earrings, but um, <laughs> um, uh, it's just I'm just grateful for you. Um, I'm grateful that not only that you are who you are, that you shine like a bright light, that you are completely unapologetic. And I say that not because you're, I mean, yes, obviously part of it is because you're non-binary and you're they, them, but your brightness and your, your bright light is way beyond that. You know, it's way beyond that. Um, you are, um, 
you know, the level of compassion that you have and the joy that you have and your vulnerability and your authenticity, it's just delicious. I don't know what else to say. And, and just thank you for that. And, um, if there's somebody listening who is maybe in some small town in Pennsylvania and feels maybe <laughs> or like in Ogdensburg, New York, or in Austin, in a big, in a truck with some big motherfucking tires, um, <laughs> Um, and, and is, is feeling other and feeling maybe having suicidal thoughts that they think that means they have to listen to them or act on them. What, do you have something to say to them? I do. Shockingly, there's nothing wrong with you. I think, um, there's nothing wrong with your thoughts. There's nothing wrong with you having them. I chose, and literally I use the word choice uh, specifically, I chose to stick around. But I want no one to feel self-judgment for any reason whatsoever. My God. Your thoughts are not your fault. The way you feel is not your fault. I, let's, let's live stigma-free no matter what we do tomorrow. Love that so much. You know, it's just love. It's just love and acceptance. It's not like, let's look at the world this way. And if you don't look at this, the world this way, then you're bad and you're fucked up. You know, um, mm-hmm. it's just, right? It's just, what if we live stigma free? What, you know, there's nothing wrong with you or your thoughts. That's gorgeous. Thank you. I want the t shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I want the There's Nothing Wrong With You t-shirt or a pillow. I'll mm. take a pillow. <laughs> Could embroider it for yes. you. So um, is there anything, I mean, now that the world is open again, are you are you wearing sequin gowns anywhere and talking? Is, <laughs> is, is there somewhere that people can go and see you speak or is there anything you want to promote? I mean, on TikTok. I mean, yeah, come on my TikTok, come on my Instagram and hang out with me. That's really what I want. Yeah. You can buy the book if you Uh, want. Oh, and buy the book. Always good. The The audio book just came out so people can hear my voice. Fantastic. And, and they can get the link, the link in your bio on Instagram for the book and the audio book. Oh my goodness. I haven't read the book. I have to read the book. You know what I'll do? I'll listen to it. I like audio books. I think you'll like it. Get to hear your voice. And, and when Jeffrey says hang out, what they say is absolutely correct. Cause when I feel like I am hanging out with you yeah. because of your ability, your ability to connect through social media is uh, fucking of off the charts. You know, people talk a lot about, you shouldn't be so addicted to social media, but this is our sense of community for some people, for people like me, it's the only place they can see people like them. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I say stay addicted. <laughs> Get addicted and stay addicted to those pages where you belong. I agree. Try not to stay addicted to a page that's all about how that makes you think that your nose or your butt or your eyes or your whatever aren't the right shape. Um, well, that's a whole nother conversation, right? huh? Yeah. Y- you know, because I mean, I'm with you. I love social media. I met you through Instagram. I met Zach Scow, who's an animal rescuer through Instagram. I've met, I, you know, I found out about Nicole Sachs through a podcast that I listened to. Like I'm all about it because it is connection and we are all starving for it. And it's, uh, it's why I'm on the planet so I can connect and have meaningful connections. Yeah. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's been my pleasure. It really is the great honor of my life. I know. Can I, I want to say one more thing. Yes, Absolutely. 30 seconds. Um, People like me are not supposed to have a voice. Even now. Um, When I say have a voice, I mean, literally like be on podcasts and tell our story and talk to people. So I never take moments like this for granted. Thank you deeply. Means everything. You're welcome. And when I say my pleasure, I mean that so, (laughs) so deeply. I was so excited when you responded and said yes. Really. Who would say no to you? (laughs) Get to know you a little bit. Jeffrey, 
I don't know if I told you this, but we end with three questions. And they are, is there something you hope to lose within the next year? I'll give you a, a suggestive answer. I want to lose the pink glass ceiling in television about building a show from the ground up around a non-binary person. That's what I want to lose. Oh, honey, I think it's ripe. I think it's ripe for that. I think <laughs> it's hint. ripe for that to happen. <laughs> I mean, I would, I will help you however I can. You know, I'm a writer, Thanks. so I'll just say that. Oh, I got chills. I got chills. I love that so much. Okay. Question number two, is there something you hope to gain within the next year? More family members, more friends, more community. I'll help you out with that if, if I can too. <laughs> <laughs> Tell that bank teller about me. <laughs> okay. And last but not least, something you hope you never lose. Mm, my innocence. Mm. You know, that habit of seeing the best in people. Yeah. Hope I never lose that. That's really good. All right. Well, thank you again. Thanks. Thanks for your heart. Thank, oh, and thank you for making my heart happy. So there we have Jeffrey Marsh. They're pretty fascinating, right? And I feel like uh, that there's much more to learn about them. And so stay tuned for a part two. Okay. And if you're not following them on Instagram, please do. If, if only for the accessories, <laughs> amazing earrings, amazing. I'm humbled in their presence. Okay. So, um, what are we doing now? Oh, I know. Uh, we have a, we have a letter from last week, right? Yes. Uh, in relation to, to boo, right? Yes. I, I've got to start Boo, ca stop to calling Mary. Mary Boo. I've got to stop, <laughs> Mary. I'm I'm sorry, sorry, Mary. But you know that when I call you Boo, it's only with the greatest of affection. Uh, yeah. So and right, it had to do with losing someone and whether you got the chance to say goodbye or not. Yeah, and spending time with that special person. And, yeah, uh, yeah. That's what we asked for. That's what we asked for. So let's see what we got. Here we go, dear Nelsie and Ronnie. I always like it when they mention you, Ronnie. <laughs> I met my biological dad at 20. Ooh, wow. That's just, that's like an opening line of a, gr of a great story. And when I say great, I mean fascinating, right? Yeah. My mother and stepfather got caught lying when I was 18. Wow. I found him on Facebook and luckily he was right where my mom left him. What? <laughs> like on a corner? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. He flew me out for a week and I ended up moving in with him shortly after it. Wow. It was like I found a missing piece of myself when I met him. Oh my goodness. I wasn't in a good place anyway and I was going through a lot. We haven't stopped talking since we met. Still, three years later, you can't get us to shut up and stop talking over each other. I have a lot of resentment and anger over the situation. Yeah, I guess so. I'll never get those years back. Oh, but it's really good to find out where you come from. It was wild seeing the similarities in our facial features. And I have a five-year-old daughter who looks like his family. I really did get lucky. I have a whole new family now. Wow. And that's Chai C. That, well, Chai C, thank you for that story. And I'm so glad you found him. Sorry it was 20 years late, but man, that's crazy. Yeah. And, and. And thank God it was a good story though, right? Oh yeah. I mean, it could have gone either way. Exactly. You could find your birth father or mother and go, oh, <laughs> that was kind of a drag. Why did, you know? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I have a, I have a very good friend who was adopted and she found her birth parents and discovered that after they gave her up for adoption, they got married. Have I told you this, Ronnie? No. They got married, and so she found not only her birth mother and father, she found three full siblings. Oh, my gosh. And you know what else she found out, Ronnie? What? She's half Filipino. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So she's like- Does she didn't know? No. She didn't know she was no, Filipino? No. And That's you would so not funny. look at her, and you wouldn't look at her and go, oh, half Filipino. Oh, she's like me. Yeah. You would have to like- 
really squint your eyes and <laughs> take a second. Isn't that crazy? It's so funny. Like she would look in the mirror and not even think of that she was like biracial at all. Not for a heart. No, she got green eyes and yeah, no, not for a minute. Wow. Finds out mom and dad put her up for adoption because they were like star-crossed lovers, right? Because the mom was white and the dad was Filipino. So the, their parents didn't want him to get married. Oh. After they put her up for adoption, they got married anyway and had three, three children. Wow. Yeah. That's so crazy. And she had a lot of feelings about that, needless sure. to say. <laughs> like, Wait a minute. You gave me up and then you got married? And I'm I, Filipino. I, I, I waited. I wait a minute. Hold on. That's a lot. <laughs> That's, That's a, a lot, lot right? Yeah. Yeah. Damn. yeah. I know. I know. Crazy. Crazy. And then sometimes you wish that your birth parents were not really your birth parents, you know? Like, you know, how many kids <laughs> like dr dream, oh, please let me be adopted. Please let me find out I'm adopted. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my, God. oh my lord all right well i'm happy for you chai c that is really a good story and um i guess we need a letter for next week right yeah we need a letter for next week well let's think about jeffrey jeffrey talked about really mostly about having a revelation in the buddhist monastery about wanting to keep living and right because they had yeah. gone through very dark times of like they said, you know, that deciding to stay living was really a choice and also letting go of shame uh, and letting go of self-hate. Like they, they said that they have a zero, I'm, 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 I'm misquoting, but sort of like a zero tolerance for like ever having like shame about themselves, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah. So I don't know. I feel like sometimes you're better at this than I am, Ronnie. Somebody, if you, any anybody who's listening, if you have a moment where you'd been through some really dark times, and then like for Jeffrey, it was this Buddhist monastery and min and meditating and having this revelation, and that's when everything changed for them. I was like a moment of true self. I like that. All right, guys, you're on it. <laughs> Let us know. You can contact us at losingitcontact at gmail dot com. You can follow us on Instagram at losing it podcast and Hey, Oh, and by the way, guys, do you like the new, do you like the new logo? Oh yeah. Tell us how much you like it. Tell right? us the new brand. Yeah. Tell We have new branding. Thank you, Ronnie Whaley. Uh, yeah. So tell us about the new branding, tell your friends, rate, review, and subscribe. And please, I beg of you don't poop in the ocean. Losing it, losing it, losing it, losing it, losing it, losing it, losing it. You came and you listened to the story. I hope so much that it didn't make you sorry. And I hope so much that you'll come back again. Losing It, hosted by Nelsie Spencer. Produced by me, Ronnie Whaley. Theme song by Hunter Williams. Follow us online on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and all podcasting platforms at Losing It Podcast. Viewers can email Nelsie with questions or comments about life, writing, comedy, or even your own Losing It story for a chance to be on the Losing It Podcast at losingitcontact at gmail.com. For everything Nelsie and everything Losing It, visit us at nelsiespencer.com.